grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, welcome to Ascension. My name is Stephen. I'm an elder here. Um, and as always, it's, it's a great privilege to, to be together, to worship together, uh, whether on the live stream or here in person. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, we celebrate the moment that the disciples received the Holy Spirit and quite a dramatic scene. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to read from Acts chapter 2. We're going to hear of that beginning of the new movement in human history. First, let's reflect on a moment from uh, further back in history when we see a common pattern of pride emerge in the human people at Babel. At that point in history, we read in Genesis, the whole earth had one common language. They built a uh, uh, you know, overwhelming, huge city and also a tower that reached to the heavens. And they did that for themselves. Um, it was an endeavor in pride. And the result was God um, ultimately dispersed them, mixed up their languages. They couldn't understand each other anymore. But the story of Pentecost, we see this reverse. The pattern changes. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes. The barrier of languages is broken. Uh, Peter repeats the words of the prophet Joel. And Joel talks of people from all walks of life coming together. He talks about the grace of God extending to anybody who calls on the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and uh, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Persia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others said, mocking said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Can you stand while I read the words of, of the prophet Joel? And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Let's remain standing and let's sing of this great God that, um, that has done, done this great thing.
is like you. God who saves. Thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for sending your spirit. We'll continue to worship you this morning. Amen. You can take a seat. For a call to confession this morning, it's Pentecost Sunday, so it's fitting for us to focus on how the Holy Spirit works in us through our confession repentance. Ephesians 5, which I'll read in a second, uh, we're warned to look carefully at how we're walking in life, but we're also encouraged to be filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit's a gift to us from God uh, and a continuous blessing um, through the process of sanctification, and that's the process of us becoming more and more like Jesus. To be filled by the Spirit is to grow in our commitment to God's Word, um, and it's to grow in grace. So I'm going to read these verses from Ephesians 5, um, and then take the opportunity to silently pray, uh, confess times when you've grieved the Holy Spirit by not following the path that God has laid for you. Ephesians 5, verses 15 to 18. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your gift, the Holy Spirit that fills us, that renews us, guides us. We thank you that as we confess the times that we've not followed your path, we do so knowing that your grace pulls us back onto the right road. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit who guides us in that process. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Now let's stand, uh, join together in worship. Let's be encouraged by the gift of the Holy Spirit that fills us. Oh, uh-huh. 
great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted this morning and to introduce our, our guest uh, pastor this morning as well. I'd like to turn your attention as you're following us online and here uh, to go to your digital connection card. Please fill that out. Let us know that you're here with us today 
If you have any prayer requests, please include those. And I believe you can indicate your interest in any one of the events that I'll be mentioning here in a moment. Um, just wanted to highlight a few things. On June 26, uh, there's a group of us that are going to Long Island. Actually, I will not be going. I will be in St. Louis seeing my family at that time, because I haven't seen them in now two years because of COVID. But for those who are here, you should totally go. Um, really encourage uh, couples with kids to attend. It's not just going to be a visit to the vineyards, although that is a definite perk. But um, please bring your children to the aquarium visit as well. And of course, it's a great time of Christian fellowship. So please consider coming. Uh, growth groups are ongoing, so if you haven't signed up for a growth group, please go ahead and do so. Um, as Pastor Michael has been preaching through the book of James, which I find personally incredibly enriching and encouraging as a, as a believer in Jesus, um, Proverbs is, uh, is something that we'll be looking at in our growth groups going forward as it's very resonant with what we're hearing about in the book of James, so um, please join us for that time. Women's Bible study, the next women, women's Bible study is happening in June. You can see that in your digital connection card. And um, that wraps it up for the announcements. I'm, I'm pleased to introduce our, um, our guest pastor this morning, this Rabbi Irving Salzman. He's a good friend of the Kitkas, um, a good friend of our church, and we went on a trip to Israel, Palestine with him in 2018. So, welcome. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Ascension. It's great to be back here with you today. Great to be back with you here today. Living in a fallen world where injustice unfortunately exists, there are a myriad of things and events that can generate legitimate outcries against injustice. There are judgments rendered in this fallen world that warrant our verbal protests. As most of us know, recently, a white police officer by the name of Derek Chauvin was on trial for the death of an African-American man by the name of George Floyd. Now, I am not a lawyer, I'm not a judge, I'm not a jury. We do know that a murder conviction must come with intent. In other words, in order to secure a conviction of murder one, if you will, a lawyer must prove that there was intent to commit murder. Ultimately, only God knows the true intent of a man's or a woman's heart. And I'm glad that I don't have to render decisions like those. But in the case of George Floyd, there is video that shows that Floyd began complaining that he couldn't breathe while he sat in the back seat of the police cruiser, well before Derek Chauvin laid hands on him. And it may be that Floyd's respiratory difficulties were caused by the drugs that he had ingested earlier. And I do know that some people argued on the basis, on that basis, that it was the drugs that killed George Floyd and not Derek Chauvin. However, given that George Floyd was verbally complaining that he couldn't breathe, it was an egregious thing for Derek Chauvin to put his knee on George Floyd's neck for nine plus minutes. What on earth could Derek Chauvin have been thinking? A man is in distress telling you that he cannot breathe and you kneel on his neck for nine minutes or so. How can you possibly do that to a man that is telling you that he cannot breathe? When both the prosecution and the defense rested their case and it was given to the jury to decide, much of America braced, much of black America braced for what the verdict would be. And we know that Derek Chauvin was ultimately convicted of several counts of manslaughter. But what if the jury had rendered a different decision? What if they had acquitted Derek Chauvin of any guilt or any fault or any wrongdoing in the death of George Floyd? Most people believe that there would have been a huge outcry against the verdict and there probably would have been rampant rioting and protests to boot. Thankfully it didn't come to that, but if it had, 
Most of us could certainly have understood and empathized with black America and with all justice-loving peoples that would certainly have felt that justice was not served. There are times that warrant outcries against judgments and verdicts rendered against injustice. And there are times that history records when people should have spoken up and made their voices heard, but did not, with many choosing to remain silent instead. When Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich began implementing the Nuremberg racial laws and discriminating against Jews, there was nary a whimper. Not nearly cried out, or not nearly enough cried out or protested. In fact, Martin Niemöller, the famous German pastor, lamented that when he said this, a quote that he is best remembered for, and I quote, he said, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out. Why? Because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out. Why? Because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out, because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. His point was that Germans had been complicit through their silence in the Nazi imprisonment, persecution, and murder of millions of people. He felt this was true, in particular, of the leaders of the Protestant churches of which his own Lutheran church was one denomination. It is right and it behooves us to decry injustice and stand up and make our voices heard. There are times when it is absolutely right to protest. But there are also times when silence is the better option. Silence, the nobler course of action. Now, I'm not going to say anything about that, those times or the appropriate criteria just yet, but I will get to that in this morning's sermon. In this morning's sermon, we will see when our silence is optimal, when silence is commendable, when silence is the right thing, and when silence is the best thing. So without further ado, would you please turn with me to Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 to 3, for this morning's sermon that I have entitled, The Sound of Silence. The Sound of Silence. Those of you, by the way, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that Paul Simon is from this very area, right, Michael? Is that true? Right, Paul Simon's from this very part of it. And of course, he is the one that wrote that famous song, The Sound of Silence. So you probably recognize that title from the song. Now, as you're turning to Leviticus chapter 10, uh, when I talk about the sound of silence, right, uh, it almost sounds like an oxymoron to us, doesn't it? You maybe are thinking right now, how can silence sound like anything? We typically tend to think of silence as the absence of sound, right? Silence doesn't have any sound by definition. Would you agree? Well, but let me tell you, silence can have sound. Have you never heard the saying, the silence is deafening? Or silence can in fact speak volumes. When is silence the best response? A fascinating and instructive verse comes to us in our passage this morning, which I will now read for you. Leviticus chapter 10, verses one to three, okay? You, you're looking at it? Okay. Now, Nadab and Abihu, okay, by, by the way, if I revert back into Hebrew, uh, their names are Nadav and Avihu, so forgive me if I revert back. It's really hard trying to maintain the, the English pronunciation and the Hebrew pronunciation, all right? But Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, they placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, Behold, 
by, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron, therefore, kept silent. You know, typically when I prepare a sermon, I outline my text or my message. In other words, I like to trace the flow of thought or the flow of action in any passage. And I will tell you that I am not unique in that way. Most people who preach sermons and prepare messages do that. Outlines organize the flow of thought or the flow of action, or in some cases, the flow of the argument, the argument of a passage. Passages like our text this morning are not in the Bible happenstance. There is a reason why they are included in the narrative of the Bible. They have something to say to us. They have a message to convey. In fact, I would say a message from God. And to understand the message conveyed in and by any given passage, outlines are very helpful. They both help us to see and communicate cogently the flow of thought, action, or reasoning in any given text of scripture. So if you're following along with me, verse one gives us Roman numeral one of the outline this morning. It describes to us what Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron did. Specifically, what did they do that would warrant what happened to them? And to remind you, just in case, we did, I did read it a couple of moments ago, but they died. So what did they do to warrant such drastic and severe action? Well, first of all, it needs to be said that Aaron and his sons had just completed an intense and rigorous course of training in their priestly duties and rituals. And you may remember that a whole string of chapters at the end of the book of Exodus take up with the subject of the building of the tabernacle. And I would venture to say, that a lot of people who start out the year, you know how we make New Year's resolutions? And a lot of people start out the year with the goal of reading through the scriptures in the entire year. And they start out at Genesis and it is going smoothly and quickly, right? We love the stories of Genesis, amazing, right? And then you kind of get to the book of Exodus and toward the end of Exodus, there's a whole bunch of chapters about the tabernacle with the furnishings and the tent pegs and the curtains and the vestments that the priests had to wear and the breastplate, of, right? All these different things. And you start getting bogged down a little bit. Then you get to the book of Leviticus and there's the fellowship offering and there's the sin offering, right? There's the guilt offering. Uh, a lot of people get stuck, right? It's not the most easy or, it, or, or fascinating reading if you like. But here, they had just finished their regimen and training and schooling in their priestly duties, right? And they had just been ordained and consecrated and dedicated to the priestly office. And now in Leviticus chapter 10, verse one, we read that Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, begin to perform their priestly duties and they launch their priestly career, if you will. But something is gonna go very wrong. To understand that, we need to know just what Nadab and Abihu did. Hence, Roman numeral one, what Nadab and Abihu did. The text tells us in verse one that they took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, they placed incense on it and then it says they offered Aish Zara, strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. Now, I can tell you there's no shortage of uh, interpretations and suggestions that have been offered to attempt to identify precisely what this strange fire was. Some have suggested that Nadab and Abihu took the coals from someplace other than the altar of burnt offering. They didn't take the fire from where it was supposed to be taken, namely the altar of burnt offering. So this view actually holds that the coals themselves were strange, they were unauthorized, or they were taken from a source not authorized by God. Others say that the wrong kind of incense was used. And by the way, the laws in Exodus actually lay out the exact formula and spice and chemical composition that the incense called for, that it was to be made from. 
So some believe that the particular incense that Nadab and Abihu used did not conform to that law. Others speculate that the two sons of Aaron were performing the incense offering at an unprescribed time. According to the law, incense offerings were to be performed once in the morning and again at twilight. So this view maintains that Nadab and Abihu made this offering at a different time, a time of their own choosing. Finally, another view believes the misstep of Nadab and Abihu may have been that they entered into the Holy of Holies at an inappropriate and unauthorized time. And the people who hold this view actually use supporting scriptures. They go to Leviticus 16, verses 1 and 2, which, by the way, lays out the laws for the high priest on the Day of Atonement. Let me just read to you Leviticus chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. It says this, Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they had approached the presence of the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, or he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Okay? So in other words, so that Aaron and his descendants after him would avoid a similar fate as that of Nadab and Abihu, God specifically warned that no high priest could enter at any time on a whim into the Holy of Holies other than the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. Otherwise, they would die. There was only one day of the year that the whole high priest could go into that room, the Holy of Holies, and otherwise people would die. Well, certainly plausible, right? In fact, all four of the explanations and suggestions are possible. Ultimately, we don't know. We don't have more information to go on, but here is what we do know. Here is what I can say with definiteness. Leviticus 10.1 says they offered strange fire before the Lord, and then what does it say? Which he had not commanded them. That's the crush of it. Whatever they did, it was not according to the commandment of the Lord. It was unauthorized. They approached the presence of the Lord in an unsolicited, unauthorized way. And that is unacceptable. Not by those who represent God. What Nadab and Abihu did, what they were guilty of, was that they did their own thing as opposed to what the Lord wanted them to do. They did as they pleased instead of taking their cues from the Lord. They listened to their own voices, not the Lord's. They did what they wanted, not what the Lord had commanded. Call it whatever you want, but there is no way of getting around the fact that they were disobedient. Nadab and Abihu abused their priestly privilege and made up their own rules as they went along instead of submitting to Yahweh, the Lord's instructions. And there would be a consequence for their actions. Notice verse 2, where we come to Roman numeral 2 of our outline, what the Lord did. We've just considered what Nadab and Abihu did. Verse 2 tells us what the Lord did. And it says, and, the fi and fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. The Lord judged Nadab and Abihu by fire, and he killed them. They lived dangerously. In fact, they plied their own fire. Consequently, God sent his fire. You know, there's a saying, if you live by the sword, what? You'll die by the sword. And that proverb is essentially an idiom that basically means what goes around, comes around. If you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. If you live violently, you'll very likely die violently. In Nadab's and Abihu's case, they lived by their fire and they died by somebody else's fire. God's fire. Action, reaction. Poetic justice, perhaps. The judgment matched the crime. There was a certain symmetry here. And the more that I thought about this verse, the more I recall to mind a certain figure of speech for the Lord that is found in several different passages throughout the scriptures. You know what the scripture actually says? It says, the Lord is a consuming 
fire. Nadab and Abihu learned that lesson the hard way. Leviticus 10.2 vividly illustrates that. Now, I will tell you that Nadab and Abihu were not the first to do things their own way. They were not the first to go their own way. Neither was Fleetwood Mac, by the way. You might remember the story of Adam and Eve and how God planted them in a garden with all that they could possibly want. They enjoyed intimate fellowship with the Lord. They enjoyed the bounty of his abundant provision for them. And he only gave them one commandment, one prohibition. Shouldn't be too hard, right? They could do anything else. In the garden, there was one tree from which they were not given permission to eat, the tree of the knowledge of, the, of good and evil. God specifically commanded them not to eat the fruit of that day of that tree. In fact, he said, in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. And just like Nadab and Abihu in our text today, Adam and Eve followed their own inclinations. They rejected God's instructions and did as they willed instead. And true to God's word, they did die that day. Oh, I know they didn't just expire, right? But they died spiritually. And it also set into motion the process of physical death, didn't it? Right? See, when you reject God's instructions and you follow your own inclinations, death is the natural result and byproduct. Today's text about Nadab and Abihu affirms that God brings and will bring judgment against his leaders who go their own ways and don't follow God. The judgment of God is very real. The judgment of God is no trivial matter. By the way, I would tell you that the judgment of God begins with his people and especially their leaders. 1 Peter 4.17, it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Folks, God's judgment is very real. Today's text highlights that front and center. So let's briefly review what we've observed so far. Roman numeral one, we saw what Nadab and Abihu did. They abused their priestly privilege, privilege and made up their own rules instead of submitting to Yahweh's instructions. Roman numeral two, we observed what the Lord did or the consequence of their action. Nadab and Abihu succumbed to the judgment of God and died by fire. Now, I don't know about you, there's probably a lot of people who would read this section, this passage of scripture, and undoubtedly they, would be, they might be troubled by it. Many might be tempted to question a God such as this one, right? It's hard to defend a passage like this. God's judgment might seem to be very austere and strict and rigid to some, if not many. But there was a reason for it, a rational principle, an explanation for God's action here. Aaron, no doubt, needed one. In fact, it would serve all of us to know God's reasoning here, to understand why God did what he did here. Why did he find it necessary in one fell swoop to take the lives of these two young priests? And thus we come to numeral, Roman numeral three in our passage today. What the Lord, why the Lord did what he did. An explanation for his actions. The judgment upon Nadab and Abihu may have appeared drastic. In all likelihood, it required an explanation. And perhaps no one needed an explanation for what God had done more so than Aaron, the father of the two young priests who had just perished at God's hands and as a result of God's divine judgment. So verse 3 tells us that Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke. By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. God's representatives, those that represent him to the people, have a responsibility to uphold the holiness of God. To detract from the holiness of God is to, to deny him his otherness. It denies that he is separate from us, that he is completely holy without sin. 
And so it is to the detriment of all of our hearers and all those who observe us when we undermine the holiness of God. That's why those who make him known and accessible to others must treat God as holy and must exalt him and show his holiness. Now you might be tempted to think God's justice is a little extreme here. But the honor and holiness of God are paramount. They need to be preserved. That is the highest good. There is no greater good than treating God as holy and honoring him before people. You know, Moses at a place called Meribah Kadesh in Numbers 20 did not treat God as holy before the people. You might remember that scene when the people were thirsting and lacking for water in the wilderness. Contrary to God's commandment and instructions, Moses didn't speak to the rock like he was told so as to draw water from it, but he struck it, not once but twice, angrily berating the people all the while. He failed to treat God as holy and dishonored God before and in the eyes of all the people. And it was because of that one incident that Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land of Israel. Having led the people for 40 years in the wilderness with the goal of bringing them into the land, Moses would ultimately be prevented from doing so because as God's representative to the people, he did not treat God as holy before their eyes. Now, that doesn't mean that Moses nullified and negated a whole life of faithful service by that one act. He was still a faithful servant in God's house. Though he forfeited the privilege of bringing the people into the land, God still loved Moses and was gracious to him and allowed him to see and survey the land from a high mountaintop. And so his one act of disobedience did not nullify or did not negate his whole life of service. But those who represent God must uphold God's holiness. There are consequences when they don't. Moses knew and experienced that. Nadab and Abihu experienced that in our passage today. And perhaps you know the story of a couple named Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5 in the New Testament. When the church, the body of the Messiah, was in its early and nascent stages, many believers were selling their properties or plots of land and sharing the proceeds of the sale with the believers who had nothing, those who were impoverished. Ananias and Sapphira did that too, but they held back part of the proceeds of their sale. Now, there was nothing inherently wrong with that scenario. They certainly had the right to do so. It was their land. They could have sold it, given 50%, given 30%, whatever they wanted, right? But they projected that they were donating everything while secretly holding back a part of the proceeds of the sale. Guess what? They suffered a similar fate to Nadab and Abihu. God likewise judged them and they died too. God will be honored by his leaders and before his people. God guards the holiness and the purity of his institutions and offices. Perhaps you have recently heard in the news the tragic story of the great apologist and the defender of the faith, Ravi Zacharias. For many years, Ravi Zacharias magnificently and faithfully defended and promoted and argued intelligently for the Christian faith on college campuses and in the public square and in numerous other places. I dare say that many either came to faith through Ravi Zacharias, or they were encouraged in their faith by Ravi Zacharias. Alas, it was discovered and came to light that Zacharias, Ravi Zacharias, had lived a double life. He committed numerous improprieties and conducted himself scandalously, unscrupulously, and immorally. Ravi Zacharias failed to treat God as holy and honor him 
before those whom he victimized. Now, do his failings nullify or negate the wonderful body of his apologetic work? No, but the man has been completely disgraced. In fact, all of his videos have been removed from formerly friendly Christian institutions and websites. God will judge his representatives who fail to treat him as holy and honor him before the people. God will get the honor and glory that his holiness deserves. The Lord will get the holiness and honor due his name. How important it is for God's leaders, for his representatives, and his people. By the way, it's not just the pastors, and it's not just the rabbis, and it's not just the high priests, right? It's not just the apostles and prophets. All of us, in a sense, every Christian is God's representative before others, aren't we? Right? How important for God's people that they represent him well, that they treat him as holy and honor him before the people under their charge. Finally, we come to Roman numeral 4 in our outline this morning at the end of verse 3. Roman, Roman numeral 4 focuses on what Aaron did, right? It involves and showcases Aaron's reaction to God's judgment of his sons. And notice what it says at the end of verse 3. It's just two words in the Hebrew. Vaidom Aaron. Aaron kept silent. Just two words in the Hebrew. Not very many words, right? Ever notice that sometimes you, even just a paucity of words with two words can pack a punch? It's like when you read in the New Testament, you come across this verse, it says, Jesus wept. Does that make you stop? When you think about who he was in his humanity, he's weeping over the, the state of his people, of his, oh, that they rejected him. And it says, Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. I mean, it causes you to pause there, doesn't it? And when I saw this verse, just the two Hebrew words, Vaido Maharon, Aaron kept silent. By the way, some translations say Aaron held his peace. And it was that, those words that actually attracted me to that passage because I marveled. And you know, when you first see that comment, Vaido Maharon, and Aaron kept silent, at first glance one could easily wonder why the author even bothers to include a short, pithy comment like this one. Why does the author even bother to record the fact that Aaron was silent? I mean, if you think about it, Aaron being silent was a non-action. He didn't do anything. He didn't say anything. That's what silence is. He did nothing and said nothing. So why does the author even bother to mention it at all? Well, remember that nothing in Scripture is superfluous or extraneous. Not one word of scripture is superfluous and does not deserve to be there. It is all God-breathed and useful for training, for equipping in righteousness, for reproof, proof, for correction that the man and woman of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work in every situation. So there is a reason that scripture tells us that Aaron kept silent. Moreover, you know, it's a useful exercise to ponder what Aaron might have said here. You know, I always, I always love to speculate, you know, what, what could he have said here? What might he have said? And you can imagine it. He might have said something like this. Come on, Lord, have a heart. This was their very first foray into priestly ministry. Okay, so... They didn't get it right. You could have given them more time. You could have given them another chance. These are my sons. They're my flesh and blood. And now you want me to be a minister for you too? Think how pain and how painful it must have been for Aaron to be bereft of his babies. You know, I remember, I'll never forget when I was growing up, wasn't a believer yet, I was attending a synagogue and I was about... Uh, 13 or 14, something like that. And it was the high holidays, it was Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. It's kind of like the Christmas and Easter in the church world, right? Everybody goes to synagogue. The whole town goes to synagogue. The auditorium is packed out. And I remember there was a family 
that went to our synagogue. They had two sons, one was my age, one was my younger brother Joel's age. His name was Gary. He was about 12, and Gary suddenly came, he, he was suddenly diagnosed with brain cancer. And they were trying to treat him with every known therapy at the time, and nothing worked, and Gary eventually died right before Rosh Hashanah, but maybe a week before. And I will never forget the parents of Gary in the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah, the packed auditorium. The father was wearing sunglasses, and when he took the sunglasses off, and you saw his wife's eyes when she took her sunglasses off. Both of their eyes were swollen because they had been crying and crying and crying over the death of their 12-year-old son, Gary. And I will never forget what my father told me that time. He said, Irving, there is no greater pain for a parent to have to go through than to see the death of their child. Just imagine how painful this might have been for Aaron, the high priest. The first day that their sons are on the job, they get struck down with fire. And so, I mean, Aaron might have had a whole bunch of things to say to the Lord. In one fell swoop, Aaron lost not one, but two of his sons on the very same day. But you know what? Vayidom Aharon. Aaron kept silent. This last clause in verse 3 is what attracted me and drew me to this passage. I could not help but marvel over Aaron's reaction. He was silent. Yes. But his silence was deafening. His silence spoke volumes. His silence was not without sound. Hence my sermon title this morning, The Sound of Silence. You see, his silence communicated. There was a powerful message in it. What was that message? The message was that Aaron accepted the judgment of God. He recognized the righteousness of God and that there is no injustice with him. King David, by the way, had a similar response. You remember King David's response when his son, through his illicit union with Bathsheba, remember when the son died? What did, Jacob, what did, what did King David do? He acknowledged God's righteousness and he worshiped. In fact, 2 Samuel 12, 20 says, when he found out, it says, so David arose from the ground. He had been mourning, he had been fasting, praying for his the son. And when he found out that the son was died, he got up from the ground, he washed himself, he anointed himself, he changed his clothes, and he came into the house of the Lord. And you know what it says? He worshiped. He too recognized there is no injustice with God. In Ecclesiastes 3, there's a very well-known passage that tells us there is a time and a season for everything. And in verse 7 in that chapter, it says, there is a time to be silent and a time to speak. James 1.19 says, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. There are times that we need to speak up. We need to raise our voices against the injustices in this world. Think of Esther who spoke up for her Jewish people in the book of Esther when their destruction was threatened in the days of the Persian Empire. Think of those like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Jan Karski who spoke up against Hitler in the Third Reich and their program to annihilate the Jews of Europe during the Holocaust. By all means, decry human injustice. But there's also a time to be silent. There is no injustice with God. God is only righteous in his judgment. When God judges, it's time for us to be silent. When the Lord judges, it is a time for his people to hold their peace and accept his judgment. You know, there's a traditional prayer and confession of Jewish mourners. There's the phrase, Baruch Dayan. Amen. See, when Jews go to the funeral home and the, the, the funeral is about to start, the rabbi will come over and he will lead them in this prayer, Baruch Dayan Ha'emet. It's a confession which means, blessed is the true judge. 
In other words, God is always righteous in his judgment. Aaron's silence reminds us of that this morning. That is the sound of his silence. That is its message for all of us this morning. That's why the scriptural author included these two little words here by Edom and Haron. They are not extraneous at all. They were written for our instruction. I'm going to close in prayer in a moment, but I want to ask for our reflection this morning. What about us? When we go through trial or hardship or adversity, or perhaps we, you know, God does discipline his children, Hebrews 12, right? When we go through the discipline of God, do we go kicking and screaming? Do we protest against the Lord and what he's doing or what he's done in our lives? Or do we imitate Aaron here and choose to remain silent and hold our peace? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this amazing passage of scripture. It has so much to say to us. Father, we know that you are the God who is righteous in his judgment. That you do everything right. And Lord, we pray that we would recognize that. We would recognize when we go through discipline. That it is for a reason. That you're trying to cultivate in us the life of your son. And so I pray, Father, that we would be people who would hold our peace when we go through the justice of God. Help us to be like Aaron, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Rabbi Salzman, for that convicting word. I know I will be thinking about Aaron's silence today in light of all the injustice that happens in the world and what we feel like we need to say or in ways that we need to be silent. So thank you for that. We're entering into our time of commitment and connection. This is an opportunity to um, pray about our offerings and what you're able to give to Ascension. I, um, I asked Michael if I could share a, a proverb that I, I read this morning in my devotion um, that spoke to me personally about my finances, and I want to share it with you just because I feel like it was really resonant for me as a Christian in thinking about how I view money, and I don't often think about money enough, um, but the proverb is from 30, uh, Proverbs 30, verses 8 through 9, and it says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal, and profane the name of my God. And, um, and just thinking about how we um, think about money, how we spend our money, I just want to offer you that scripture as a way to reflect on, um, on our giving and how much we're able to give or if we're withholding um, our giving as well. Everything we have is the Lord's. So would you join me in a time of prayer for our offering, please? Heavenly Father, thank you um, for all the ways in which you provide for us, big and small. I just pray for the offering this morning, Lord, and just pray that um, uh, we would be discerning in our hearts and how we think about our finances and what we're able to, to give back to the church, um, your body that gives us so much, um, represents you in the world. Thank you for Ascension Church, Lord. And I just thank you for our time of um, prayer and offering this morning. It's in your son's name I pray, amen. So this is a new song to us. Um, Maybe some of you have heard it before, or if you clicked the link in the email on Friday and you heard it, that'd be a good way to listen to the music before Sunday. Um, it's called Shepherd, and as I was talking with Irving just before the, the sermon and just thinking about how do we, it's going to be a challenging thing, as, as Aaron said, like to, I'm going to be thinking about this, like this is hard, you know, um, and so I think in, in God's providence, thought about this song, um, the Lord is shepherd. Um, Jesus said that he is the good shepherd. 
Um, and we see, uh, you know, Psalm 23, David writing about who the Lord is. The Lord is my shepherd. And so, um, as we as we think about how do we how do we enter into this? Um, if you want to sing this song, you can. Um, but but it, as you let these things marinate on you, you can think about um, the Lord as your shepherd. Um, whether you're walking through challenging things, um, or uh, if you're even if you're walking in rebellion from Him, like thinking about the Lord as your shepherd and that He desires your good, and you can trust that. So let's sing it. In the 
darkest valley I know I know my shepherd is all I need Lord you are all we need God help us to grow in our in our trust of you being our shepherd God you are good you are the good shepherd you've given us so so much reason Lord. and on this day um, the day of pentecost we thank you that you've given us your spirit to uh, to remind us that um, that you're with us and we can trust you jesus name. remain standing for the benediction Would you bow with me for the closing benediction? Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha Ya'er Adonai panavelecha v'chuneka Yisa Adonai panavelecha v'yasem lecha Shalom The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Let us go forth in peace to love and serve our city. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen.